Hello everyone, this is Dr. Ushal Kumar and today I will be speaking on an important disease Abdominal Tuberculosis, the Great Masquerader and USG to the rescue. Let's go in for some data first. In 2018, WHO reported 10.2 million cases of TB. The death figure was around 1.2 million. Interesting part is India has approximately one-fourth of the disease burden as per 2018 data. So India is one of the leading countries uh, affected by tuberculosis. Abdominal tuberculosis uh, compounds to about 10 to 20 percent of total load. Objective of this presentation is to highlight the important role of ultrasound in diagnosing abdominal cox, which is a great masquerader. Many patients are often left undiagnosed due to lack of proper diagnostic workup or follow-up. Tuberculosis is endemic in Asia and Africa and it is re-emerging in the Western world along with HIV AIDS. The rates are rising, are consistent with the overall trend. TB poses a diagnostic challenge because many a times features are non-specific, they can lead to diagnostic delays and can lead to multiple complications too. So, a high index of suspicion is an important factor for early diagnosis. Abdominal involvement can occur in the GI tract, the peritoneum, the lymph nodes or the solid viscera which is rare. The spread is further aided by poverty, overcrowding and drug resistance. So again, early diagnosis is the key. Most patients which are diagnosed and are put on AKT respond very well and surgery is required in minority of the case only. One more telling ground reality in the Indian subcontinent is the lack of resources and affordability to carry out diagnostic tests. Therefore, today in this scenario, I propose the liberal use of ultrasound and ultrasound guided procedures as the first line of diagnostic repertoire. Ultrasound technology has moved from leaps and bounds Excellent high frequency linear probes and unparalleled resolution even at greater depths are now the USP of most machines. Good spatial resolution, cost effectiveness, reproducibility and being easily available even in the remotest areas uh, gives ultrasound an edge. To maximize the ultrasound machine capability we have to just take care of these 4-5 or five factors. The, these are the transducer frequency proper adjustment of the depth, focus, gain and the most important factor is spatial compounding. Most common abdominal symptom is abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, fever and anorexia also are very important systemic uh, complaints. Now classification of tuberculosis, I won't go into the details of these, I'll just go into the peritoneal classification. Peritoneal classification is divided into three types, so the wet ascitic type where there is copious amount of free fluid and can be loculated to the fixed fibrotic type where you can get multiple plaques and you can also get loculations and septae the dry and the plastic type where you get fibrotic strands which are irregular but there is no free fluid generally i'll just go into four or five commonly seen types of abdominal tuberculosis at my clinic symmetrical thickening of the peritoneum and mesentery ascites which it which can be clear echogenic or loculated symmetrical bowel wall thickening most common is IC junction involvement enlargement of lymph nodes with low attenuation that is hypoechoic and occasionally there can be multiple matted lymph nodes which can be seen as the hallmark of cox many a times multiple plaques or nodular lesions in the mesentery can also be seen with complicated cox and rarely surface nodularity or visceral organ involvement mainly the liver Mesenteric disease is an important manifestation of early stage of abdominal cox. Initially, it is thickened with few discrete lymph nodes. In the later stage, however, there could be irregular inflammatory masses with increased echogenicity. Ultrasound offers a distinct advantage in demonstrating these features with adequate visualization of the normal and disease mesentery. Mesenteric lymph nodes generally show hypoattenuating 
features which could suggest areas of necrosis which are classic to granulomatous disease but they are not specific because they can be seen in necrotic metastasis the omentum involvement can also be cake like or nodular and may appear similar to peritoneal carcinomatosis which is one of the differential diagnoses in the list of differential diagnoses of peritoneal disease things which come close to mesenteric cox can be mucinous carcinomatosis pseudomyxoma peritonei peritoneal mets mesenteric fibromatosis and sclerosing mesenteritis i would not like to go into the details of all these whenever the gastrointestinal tract is involved mural thickening of the ic junction is the most common site that is the textbook picture we have learned all our lives however circumferential bowel wall thickening which can involve the ileum or the ic junction is not uncommon in cox and can mimic a uh, disease like crohn's disease which is common differential diagnosis so how would you like to differentiate the two mostly in cox there is multiple enlarged lymph nodes which can be necrotic there is omental involvement which can be echogenic and thickened or cake like and there is ascites all these features go in favor of cox and also ic junction involvement is more common in cox whereas cecum involvement is rare in crohn's disease four figures which show the circumferential wall thickening of the terminal ileum and the cecum there is an atypical case case number 18 where the cecum as well as the proximal ascending colon was involved and the diagnosis was confirmed on colonoscopy to be cox matted lymph nodes with internal breakdown this is case 1 here you can see multiple hypoechoic lymph nodes which are in close vicinity to each other and interspaced hyperechoic mesentery suggestive of matted lymph nodes classic of cox here is case number 2 in this case we can see there are multiple matted small bowel and as you can see there is copious amount of ascites and multiple small loculated areas of uh, ascites multiple septae also the third case is an interesting case where you can see all the things which are common in cox echogenic mesentery abnormal nodes thickened bowel loop which are inflamed and ascites so all features of cox in one case this is very interesting case if you can see there is minimal free fluid however the diagnosis which was clinched on this lining which was abnormal along the peritoneum thickened peritoneum we discuss cake like nodularity this is one case where there was extreme amount of ascites and multiple areas of cake like echogenic areas arising from the mesentery suggestive of omental nodularity seen with cox we discussed ileocecal cox now this image is a panoramic view of a classic ic junction cox where we can see the thickened cecum the terminal ileum classic cox okay these upper two images show subhepatic and intrahepatic involvement in proven case of cox the lower set of three images the first two show hypoattenuating lymph nodes the first one showing internal breakdown so this is of necrosis and the last image showing inflamed peritoneum also a feature of cox these are two panoramic again panoramic images of diffuse echogenic omental thickening seen in the entire abdomen in the space between the small bowel with associated free fluid both were proven case of cox two common differential diagnoses of echogenic mesentery are omental infarct appendicitis cloacae and diverticular cloacae which is very uncommon differential diagnosis this is a case where there is focal echogenic omentum in close proximity to the distal end of the descending colon as it is seen very close to the colon diagnosis of appendicitis epiploicae was suggested there is no other signs of tuberculosis in the abdomen this was a case of appendicitis epiploicae close to the descending colon the site is very important descending colon okay this case there is similar finding of echogenic 
omentum but it's close to the liver and the right kidney so it's in the right hypochondrium it's a lady it's a 40 year old lady with focal pain in the right hypochondrium this is a classic case of mental infarct there's no other differential diagnosis so i had reviewed basically uh, retrospectively 43 patients uh, from January 2017 to July 2018 who had signs of abdominal pox who were diagnosed on ultrasound most of them were on ultrasound guided intervention or other biochemical or surgical tools so this study showed definitive diagnosis was reached in 38 cases there were 5 were treated empirically common features uh, in abdominal pox of these patients were free fluid or mental thickening lymphadenopathy and or mental flux Okay, diagnosis was reached in most of these cases uh, commonly by cytic tapping, uh, biopsy and FNA. Very few of them required either a colonoscopy, surgery or biochemistry. So, being a real-time test, ultrasound-guided procedures like cytic tapping, nodal and omental biopsies can help in getting a tissue diagnosis. I'll just show a few cases I've done. This is a case of abnormal echogenic omentum with free fluid but true fluid was not tappable so i did a omental biopsy okay you can see here the gun that is the this is the case uh, where there is a very small pocket of fluid so very uh, astutely i took a spinal needle and tried to aspirate everything which was there in the pelvis it came out to be cox okay third case is interesting because though it's a simple Cox node, it is in very close proximity to the right kidney. So, uh, had to be careful, but ultimately could get a good chunk of the node and we could get to a diagnosis of course. Okay. One important thing, uh, whenever we tap fluid from the pelvis and if there is a mental thickening or the fluid is in the deep pocket, try using a spinal needle, put it entirely into, into the ascitic fluid, remove the stillet and try to aspirate. Now, I'll just give you a small example. If there is a small pelvic collection, free fluid, or mental plaque, or a mental disease, or a peritoneal node, here a USG guided procedure would be more helpful and advisable than use of cross section. So, for example, a patient turns at 3 pm, you do a USG, you get a clear cut free fluid, say free fluid in the pelvis, you call up the consultant, he says, please go ahead with the aspiration you do a guided aspiration you get a result faster and it is cost effective okay one uh, note i would like to put here is whenever you do uh, for elderly patients with comorbidities or biopsy or fna try getting the bleeding and clotting times first before you put in the okay one more important tip if you are suspecting abdominal cox and you, you may might not get enough material in from the abdomen for diagnosis always scan the cp angles and the neck before you let the patient go you might get a sizable effusion or a large node where you can get a sample from to conclude i would say ultrasound still remains the most robust initial modality of choice to diagnose abdominal cox including nodal and peritoneal disease its ubiquitous availability improved resolution has emerged as a cost effective tool in the primary diagnosis of abdominal cox without overuse of cross section. Advancement in probe technology has also given unparalleled resolution in diagnosing equivocal cases with pinpoint accuracy.